All right, welcome back. Let's get started. So just to remind you where we are, right? So we did our basic pick and place, starting with known objects and assuming known poses. And then we understood how to um, perceive a little bit, where we were looking for known objects and just figuring out the unknown pose. And then now this week we're trying to graduate to unknown objects, unknown poses, and uh, you know do this sort of simple task of clutter clearing, which we talked about a little bit uh, last time. The last time we really only did the first part of that, which was dropping a bunch of objects in the scene and started talking about uh, contact simulation. But you'll see that you know the, the contact force diagram, friction cone, things like that are going to be the foundation for what we'll talk about today. So I, you know, Bonnie asked, what, why do we have to understand this? And I hope, I hope that'll be clear by the, by the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, so we last time just talked about dropping objects, but hopefully appreciating all of the things that were happening inside that simulation in order to make that happen. Um, they get pretty complicated. <clears throat> and we talked about these sort of uh, you know simple diagrams where we talked about friction cones for uh, point contact, and then we talked about some of the other other you know, underlying technology where maybe thinking about contact at two points isn't the real solution. Maybe we need to actually integrate over an entire contact surface. And the generalization of that where bodies are potentially slightly in penetration has us doing this um, hydroelastic contact model where we're taking integrals of, of across the penetration surfaces of the object and applying not just forces, but the, the integral uh, of the of the contact force ends up giving you a wrench, a contact wrench, a spatial force, right? Um, the rotational and translational force that can be applied, can be summarized at any point on the body. Okay? Yeah. It's a surface integral. So the simple, the simple analogy would be, uh, you know, uh, just making brushing contact. And then the extension into in penetration is to think that there's some sort of balancing surface that's on which to integrate this. Yeah. Okay, so what I want to ask today, I want to get to, um, you know, actually starting to pick things up, right? So, and remember that the task is to pick things up that we don't have models of. So in order to do that, we need to extend this sort of force reasoning to start thinking about what makes a good grasp. Right, that's our first question. What defines a good grasp? And actually, this is this is what manipulation research used to be about. Right, there was like a, a heyday for manipulation in the '80s, maybe '90s where people did a lot of work on sort of grasp analysis and, and wrench analysis and the like. And, uh, and then manipulation research got a little quiet for a while and then deep learning kind of kicked it back in because now we can see the world, okay? Uh, <clears throat> but if you look in the handbook of robotics, uh, you'll see chapters devoted to sort of grasp analysis, okay? And I'm gonna give you just the, the, the ideas that we need to make a, a functional system today and you'll see you know, lots of diagrams that sort of look like this. You've got a simple manipulator. It's contacting an object at a few points. And what can we say about the, uh, the wrenches that can be resisted on that, on that body given the current placement of the fingers? And you can ask, how do I optimize the place of the fingers, for instance, and possibly the torques in the hand in order to resist the biggest wrench? Okay. So I'm going to give you a little window into that today. Um, that literature really assumes known objects. It's really based on understanding the geometry and possibly mass in, in some cases. Um, but we're going to find that there's some heuristics there that we can extend to unknown objects. And that, by the end, uh, we'll have done that. So let's start with actually just the simplest thing you should know about here is, is just if you do a kinematic analysis. Okay, so if you have 
I'll just do it in 2D on the board here, but if I have some object that's maybe slightly irregularly shaped, get another color. And I have a couple fingers touching that object, then you can ask kinematics questions about what makes a good, what would make a good grasp, right? So let's say I've got an orange object, right? And then some contact points. I'll just say they're point fingers. Okay, but they could be the tips of, of, of a more dexterous hand, okay? And the question would be like, if I'm going to choose uh, anywhere to touch the, the object with, let's say, two fingers, maybe I need three fingers, okay, where should I choose given the geometry of the object in order to get a good grasp, okay? Now, we're going to think about forces in a, in a second, but there's actually a little bit you can do even just thinking about the kinematics, just the shape, okay? And <clears throat> to do that, um, you know, the, the strongest notion sort of, of of what you can get here is called a form closure, okay? Which means if you've found locations of your fingers such that if your fingers don't move, then basically the object is completely wedged. No, there is no direction, rotation, translation, in which the object could move. That's going to be, that's useful if you're like, I don't know, fixturing things. It can be useful if you have a hand. Um, and it's interesting to think about, you know, maybe if I were to put a finger like right in that corner and maybe right in that corner, could I resist all possible motions of the hand, for instance, of the object? Maybe you need one more finger on the bottom. You need four fingers. It depends on the geometry of the object, okay? So this would be, um, if, oops. Oh, you get a multicolor things. If fingers are fixed, can the object move? And that can be formulated nicely, not surprisingly, given my biases. There's an optimization problem. But I, I won't do the whole derivation because it's not the one that's going to go the distance for us, but it's nice to sort of get the, the basic intuition. <clears throat> if you were to write um, phi of IQ as the sine distance, which we use this object a lot, right? The sine distance between finger I and the object. Then sort of by definition, if we start off and say that all of our fingers are on the, on the object, then we know that, that we have this to begin with, the sine distance is zero. The question is, is there an incremental change in the, in the configuration that could change that, true or false? Or could I make, in particular, let's just even make it clear that we'll there's some parts of the vector Q that are sort of related to the robot and some that are related to the object, okay? So the question really, a form closure, you have a form closure if I'll write it this way, this is the standard way to write it here. If I were to make a delta change in my object pose, just a second, I'm going to leave the robot pose fixed, okay? And if I say that nothing can be in penetration, if this satisfying this condition implies that delta Q object must be zero, then you have a form closure, okay? So basically there is no, no rotation, this is just the counter, counter 
positive, I guess, of, uh, you know, there's no rotation that you could do that could cause fingers to go, you know, they could um, so cause you to go into penetration, right? Or leave the object, actually. But. Yep. So you're you're allowed to leave. Um, yeah, I guess I guess you could leave, but you're in order for this to be if if this, which is the true conditions that you're not allowed to penetrate, implies that your object can't move at all. Right? Then I think it, it means what I say. Right? So um, right, if you found some object, some some mo motion of the object that could cause separation, then this condition is not true. It's the it's the opposite statement. It's actually it's actually both. Yeah? It's actually both. It's actually both. Uh, it could, well, it could be that that uh, I, I think I think it may, maybe I said it the opposite way and that wasn't helpful. Pretend I didn't say that. <laughs> I think this is sort of is sort of clear. This is the clearest singular way to say it, which is that that if you you know any delta change to the object, it will either that you know that that does not cause penetration would have to imply the only one that is viable is if the object is still. Okay. The intuition is that the object cannot move and it cannot penetrate. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yep. Okay, let's think through that. So so what if if the object could fall off the hand, then this condition could be satisfied with an object that was not zero, with a delta object. Therefore, we would not call it a form closure because maintaining this statement does not imply that the Q object had to be zero. Okay? And if if it was in penetration, then it would fail this case. Yeah. Yeah. That's the condition. Yes. I was about to do it. So he says, he says, can we state that in a differential way? Uh, it's an interesting question. Yeah, so, so uh, how would you check this? Um, you can do a first order check of this. You can check a first order form closure by looking at um, basically looking at this matrix, right, and asking could you find a delta change in Q that causes that violation to be invalidated? Okay, uh, because there's many eyes. So, yeah, if I if I make this the vector of many contact points, yeah, and it turns out so so the conditions are certainly require that the rank of that matrix has to be six in three D. Because it's or three and two D, okay. But that's not enough. You also have to check the the that you can't. The separation is separate from the uh, from penetration. So in full, it, you can be you can check that condition. Oops. with a small linear program. So if you just tell me the, where the fingers are, then you can ask the question, is it a for, form closure by solving a small linear program? Okay, which just basically writes down this kind of objective. Interestingly, sorry, let me finish again. So interestingly, the Using the differential form is actually not necessarily, sorry, I should be careful. I almost said not necessarily sufficient, but let me be more precise. Uh, it is possible that you have a form closure, but the first order analysis does not reveal it. And that happens if you have curvature 
for instance. Like you can have things like this, like you're holding a, an hourglass, okay, which the first order analysis would suggest you could move this way, but the second order analysis says that you can't move that way, okay? So in, this is not a sufficient check. Yeah. But, so, but you can do second order checks and everything too if you need to. If you, if, as soon as you find a proof that it can't move, you're done. But if you don't find a proof, you might have to go deeper into a higher order analysis. Okay, right? Oh, sorry, I didn't see your hand. You could definitely do the, do some. So your question was, could I just remove the point or like perturb the point and then do it again? That would be sort of an the number of times you perturb it would be roughly equivalent to the finite. You know, that would be the the, the degree, of, the order of your analysis. Yes, I think I think if you perturb it once, it would be a, equivalent to a you know with high probability a second order analysis. And if you perturbed it twice, you know, then and you did a second difference, I, I think it would give you strength the more times you, you did that sample. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In practice, these are not like uh, big computational bottlenecks. Right? These, are, these are small problems. Yes? Q is the configuration vector of the entire system. So always it's our, like our joint angles or the quaternion. Yeah. Generalized position. Okay, so that's like the most clean, maybe beautiful, like saying that if your fingers are, are held in position or if they're, you know, just, if I move my hand, you know, the, but I keep my hands in the same, relative, my fingers in the same relative position, then the object will move with my hand, right? It's caged, it's completely trapped. But, okay, we have, if we have a two-fingered gripper, then it's really hard to just have a two-fingered gripper that achieves a form closure. It's too much to ask. To say you're completely caging an object in general, right? You can. There's cases where you're maybe holding a tool and you've got a you've achieved a form closure or something like this. But a two-fingered gripper has a hard time of it. Yeah. This has nothing to do with friction. So the next step is to think about friction. Yeah, and that's that's what we need to get the static analysis. So there's no forces even here. This is only kinematics. So you have to think about, you know, once you think about statics, then we can think about just squeezing in order to hold it. Exactly right. Yeah, so the next step would be statics analysis. Statics being the branch of mechanics would fall into statics where everything is stationary, but you're still thinking about forces, and dynamics, which would be things are moving and you're thinking about forces. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so the question, the new question would be, this was like given a kinematic perturbation of the object. Can I break the grasp roughly? And the new question is, given a force perturbation of the object, because my current does my current grasp resist that force, right? And I mean a spatial force or a wrench. Let's just think about this for a second here. So um, let's say um, we're in 2D because I'm on the board. And let's just assume there's no rotations possible for a second. It's a kind of a weird thing to think about it. But um, let's just say uh, the, the object's going to be fixed to it. I could be x, y plane. It's just a box here, OK? And let's say I have a finger here and a finger here and this 
finger has a friction cone like this, friction cone like this. Now, you, please remember that when I draw this, even though I draw this as a sort of a conic section, it's a, it's a cone, right? I can, it's, it goes, it has infinite extent. Right? If an element is inside the cone, then a scale, a positive scalar times that element is also inside the cone. Okay, so the question would, be, interesting question here is if I'm not allowed in rotation, so the only thing that could possibly happen is someone could be applying forces vertically or horizontally. Could this grasp resist all force perturbations? What could you do that would make it, that would break it? No rotations. Seems like you might be able to push, but that's where you can squeeze harder. This isn't meant to be a trick, but this can actually resist all rotations. Sorry, all, all non-rotations. It can resist all translations. Yeah? And the geometry of that is, I think, I wanted to make the simple example because the geometry of that is beautiful, right? The question is, if someone comes in with a new force, I need a third color. You know, some applies some force and some. You have to find an element that's the sum of contributions from this and from this that for any force. My claim is that for any force vector you can draw in 2D on the board here, I can find something that's equal and opposite to it that is a combination of an element from this set and this set. Okay. And the geometry of that is the Minkowski sum. How many people know Minkowski sum? All right. Um, that's why I did this. Good. That's Minkowski sum, right from Wikipedia. Okay. So the Minkowski sum is just is an operation, it's just the natural notion of addition if you have sets. Okay. So if I have um, the Minkowski sum of the green. Sorry, I'm pointing the blue and the green set, then I get the red set with sort of this as the origin here. And the way you'd think of that is that an element is in the Minkowski sum of the two sets if I can find an element from the first set and an element from the second set, add them together and get the, the, the okay? Which you can see is exactly what I just said about the, the board. I want to find an, a, a force from one finger and a force from the other finger which, when added together, resists my wrench. So the Minkowski sum, sum of two cones, right? If I have a, a cone like this, and I were to use my spatial algebra and apply the other cone, you know, a cone like this, maybe the better way to think about it is if I were to stack them like this. So if you want to get anywhere you want to get, you, you can go as far as you want in this, and then you can take the opposite. If you give me any, any vector like this, right? I can go as far as I need to go on the first one, and then stack, and then start picking an element out of the second um, cone to get there. I can always increase that, go farther in this, vec in this direction, and find any vector. The Minkowski sum of the two cones in 2D, like this, is the entire R2. Right, so that's why we talked about, this is about the friction cone, right? That means that if I'm applying force here, I might have to squeeze harder, but I can get any force inside that cone as a possible friction. Yeah? So this object, this beautiful object, really, because it gets, it's very simple here, okay? And I hope that picture kind of makes sense. But it gets, it's, it's also beautiful in 3D. And then it's, it's still beautiful, but it's a little harder to visualize in 6D. Because we're going to do it for spatial forces, right? Yeah. Yep. 
So I could take, even if these were very narrow, right? I could, I could just go out extremely far on one cone, on, right? And then go extreme, you know, extremely far back, stay inside both of those cones, but I've got an element because these are arbitrarily far in extent, right? So I can go as, I could, if, if my goal is to go down, you know, two, then I'll go as far as I need to on this one to go down one. And then I'll go take an element from this that's as far as I need, you know, that goes exactly back that goes down the other one. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, I think so. Something like this. I mean, it's a, in here it would just be a box, but yeah. Uh, if it, once we get rotations and stuff, it'll get, it'll get that kind of structure. Yeah. Yes? So, so the no rotations case is breaking your intuition, right? I mean, I, and it breaks my intuition too, right? It, so it's weird to say that the thing can't rotate because of, yes, when, once they start getting far apart, then you're subject you're, you're to, to rotations. I only did this to sort of make the Minkowski sum picture work on the board, but that's why it's breaking your intuition. It's just because I said rotations are not allowed in this case. Yeah. Okay, and we actually saw this before, right? Remember the when I when I drew that picture of the friction cones here, right? And I said as long as mg is inside the cones, then it's not going to slide. There's a force that resists it. Right? So this is really just the generalization of that. Now, ultimately, we're going to ask the question of where do you put your fingers? in order to maximize the number of possible wrenches that you can resist. Right? And in some cases, like this one, you're going to be able to say, I can resist every wrench. That would be called a force closure, by the way. If you can resist all wrenches, then you're in a force closure. Okay, so the, it turns out that the, the Minkowski sum math works even in six dimensions, right? It's still you're going to pick an element out of the wrenches possible from one contact point, and the wrenches, you need to, in order to sum them, they ought to be taken in the same frame about the same point. Right, but the word the math all works. So let me just define a little bit carefully here the contact wrench cone. Okay, this is if I just have it for one contact, then I'll typically use some sort of script K for cone. Doesn't really matter, I guess. Okay, but if I do it in the contact frame, and I just have a sort of a Coulomb friction law, then you one element of this contact wrench cone would be a six-element vector. And if it's Coulomb friction without any torsional friction, then you'd expect the, the rotational components to be zero. And then this would be my Cx, Cy, Cz. Spent too much time, I spent too much real estate on the zeros. That makes me sad. Okay? And this is all subject to FCX squared plus FCY squared less than or equal to mu FCZ. Right? So elements of that cone would only have, have interesting things happening in the three directions of x, y, and z. And they're 
again, this ice cream cone, which comes as the friction cone. It's the same thing I just drew here. It's in 3D, and there's, a, there's an extra 3D that's doing nothing so far, because we're at the contact frame. But just like you can take any spatial force and apply the spatial algebra to it, you can actually apply it to the entire cone at once. Of course, because it's just a, a set of for a collection of forces. So if you were to apply that, the if you were to move this to a different expressed in frame, if you were to apply it to a different point, then the whole cone will shift. Okay. And the rules are are simple. Okay. The same sort of spatial algebra for spa for directly on the wrench cones. They add if they're in the same frame and applied to the same sport force. If you want to change the frame, it's a little hard to see on the board probably, but this is a BP and that's a BQ. Then you change by a cross product from P, the elements of P. You know, the forces just shift and the torques are our spatial force math. This notation here, you can always write a cross product as a matrix multiply. You just have to use skew symmetric matrices. But, but that's, just think of this as, a, you're going to take some elements and you're going to do the cross product, right? And the other one you're just going to shift because forces just translate. Yeah. This notation here says you're going to take the three element vector P and turn it into the, skew, the corresponding cross product skew symmetric matrix. So that would be a three by three matrix, which is a sub, it's the notation I use and people typically use would be to put a subscript cross product thing here. And that three by three matrix times a, a three by one vector would be equivalent to taking the cross product of those two things. Yeah. The notation PX is the skew symmetric matrix corresponding to the cross product. Yeah. And then if you want to change the expressed in frame, it's just the rotations. That's just the, that's just the, the 6D sort of version of what I wrote before. But importantly, you can apply the operation to the entire cone, which is cool, right? So, um, and we, by the way, do this all the time. Like, um, this is actually an older paper, but an older thesis actually by Hung Kai, who's out there. Um, so, you know, we used to think about how to choose where to walk, whether you needed to grab uh, a handrail for our humanoid with the same, it's kind of the opposite of sort of grasp analysis. It's the, where does the body need to touch? And it was all about the geometry and writing optimizations over these contact wrench cones, right? So you'd like to try to keep your center of mass perturbations to be nicely inside the contact wrench cone. So maybe that means you have to grab, maybe you should grab like this instead of like grabbing something right by your feet because that doesn't expand your cone very much. Okay? All right, so I tried to make a visualization for this. This is the contact wrench notebook if you are following along or want to look later. Sure, I do one finger first. Okay, here's a box with a finger, and I actually had to actively turn off hydroelastic. I, I, you know, I went through. I've been putting everything into hydroelastic this time, like I told you last time, and then I changed this one. I was like, oh wait, that broke. So I had to actually take undo this one and put it back to point contact because otherwise the pictures are too are harder to think about. Okay, so what am I drawing here? I'm drawing the um, the point of contact, I'm drawing the friction cone the way we normally think about it, but I'm also drawing the friction cone around the center of uh, the origin. I just, using my spatial algebra, I shifted that cone to the origin, okay? And if I move, so the, the red is the translational components, the blue is the rotational components, okay? So as I move the finger around, it doesn't change the translational components, right? 
applying a force in x is still a force in x. Right? So the things that I can do to my center of mass are the same, but it does change what happens in the rotational component. Now there's one thing that I don't like about this visualization, which is that it gives the impression that you could independently pick an element out of the red and out of the purple, but you can't. That's a really one six-dimensional object. Okay? So there's one time where that could be slightly misleading, but, it, but otherwise it's mostly a pretty good visualization. Yeah? Yeah, yeah the, the question is, is there, are there nice closed forms? So, so um, in some cases, yes, there are closed forms, like for instance, when it's R N. <laughs> okay, but, um, but more generally, this is, these are really natural objects for optimization. You're, a lot of optimization is over cones, actually. And they're, they're convex sets, so drawing elements out of these fits very nicely into sort of optimization-based frameworks. So, so if you want to find, an does an element exist, or what's the worst element, or something like this? then these fit very nicely into um, optimization. You can represent the separate cone, the each cone separately and write conditions that say, I, I, I mean, you can, the Minkowski sum is actually a sort of a natural operator for a cost or a constraint, right? You could actually write almost exactly, exactly the Minkowski sum equation. Draw me an element of this set, convex set, this element, this convex set, they have to sum to be the thing I'm looking for. Okay, so does that picture kind of work for people? Because it's going to get more interesting when I put the second finger in. Uh, second finger, true. Buckle your seatbelts. All right. So here we go. I can move this finger around. You see what happened here? I've got the green as the finger on the other side, but I've also applied its stuff at the center of mass. Okay. And now, it's kind of interesting, I forget what my other finger command was. Oh, yeah, here we go. All right, so what happens if I go something like this, okay? So I've, you see what I did? I kind of moved up on the box. I'm holding it from above, okay? So what's happening here? So, well, even, even when I was aligned, First thing you notice kind of is that I, I, I moved it a little bit horizontally, okay. Those moment things are low dimensional objects. I had to be careful plotting them even, okay. Because they just live, they're not full rank. Because with these are point contact models where I assumed this was zero. So if I'm even a, directly at the center of mass, there's nothing I can do to resist you could rotate directly around that axis. And in fact, it, the axis moves, okay, but if I move this up, there's always an axis where even the Minkowski sum of the wrenches, the straight line between the two fingers cannot be resisted. Instantaneously, the kinematics might resist or something, but the first order analysis says that actually I, could, I can always provide a wrench along the axis of my two forces that is not not being resisted. Okay? And that's kind of the key idea actually um, that I want that we're gonna we're gonna work with. So again, so so this is a, a beautiful object for optimization and people have, have written lots and lots of papers about how do you now optimize the grasp given a known object. Right? How do I place points optimally given the kinematics of the hand, of the of the maybe of the hand but certainly of the object in order to get the biggest contact wrench cone and possibly even force closure as a, as a strict condition okay but we want to be in the place where we don't know the object models exactly so what we're going to do is take insights from this and try to extend them to the more general case and the insight that I want to take I want you to take from this is that you're happiest if your contact points are pushing, are facing each other, okay? That's gonna be sort of your biggest, that's like the first picture I drew, okay? Where you get this nice big possible set of, of things you can 
resist. If your contact forces are on opposite faces pointing at each other, that's kind of the best case for resisting, for maximizing your wrench set. Okay? So let me write it. The intuition we want to extend is antipodal grasps. Okay, which means, for instance, if I were to just, I don't know if I had a, a weird shape like this maybe, and I had, to, had some options of where I could put my fingers. Let's say you're considering three possible two-fingered grasps, right? This may be option one, option two, option three. The grasp analysis says even if you don't really know the object, okay, you're going to be better off picking these points that are actually collinear and pointing towards, you know, the normals are actually, so the reason it's called a collinear antipodal points. Is that I want um, to find places where the normal vector Is, on the, is all on one line, so it's collinear, and it's pointing in opposite directions, in, antipodal or antipodal, depending on a tomato, tomato. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, so in translation, the relative position doesn't actually matter because those things are just invariant. It's the it's the moments that make you want to be aligned. Great question. So okay, let me see if I can convince you. Maybe I'll use an extreme case. Um, what if I? What if I had uh, this kind of thing, right? And maybe, just to make the point exactly, maybe they, they miss each other here. So that would mean that there's a point. So the wrench, I could apply a, a force at any point, but if I summarize it as a wrench at this location, then a wrench that's a, like a torque, that acts like a torque here, would pull away from this finger and away from this finger simultaneously. So it can't resist that. In translation, the Minkowski sum covers it. But in rotation, it leaves a gap. So you're better off taking that away by putting, being antipodal. Okay, that's fair. Why is it obvious from this illustration? Let me see if I can use my cursors to... So, 
yeah, you'd like to somehow cover the most space with your uh, Minkowski sum, right? Yeah. And I think the object really does kind of get more aligned, first of all, and, and smaller. So, um, okay. The rate, you know, the, the dimensionality of the Minkowski sum will be the same in these cases. But somehow the condition, the, the magnitude of the forces that you will need will be smaller in the, in the cases where, you know, it kind of balloons out in my little animation here, which is doing a, a scaled wrench applied to that. So the difference between this and this in the, um, in the, in the analysis is not about is there a direction I resist or not. It's about how much force would I need to resist. Yeah? If you're saying they're both, um, and it might be easier for me to just uh, restart it actually, to put them right back at the beginning. Um, that's right, there's exactly, but in, but in all the cases, there's one dimension where that they, they are susceptible. So the numerics are actually the best here. Yeah, this is the, this is the part where the uh, drawing them independently in wrench and, and, and translation makes it a little misleading. I, I, I agree with that. Hopefully, you see, I'll think if there's a better visualization for that. I mean, we could do it uh, numerically. We would see that the condition numbers of everything gets better when they're aligned, right? Think about if I can make that visual. Yeah. Yes. So an element in that is a is an element. Um, so it's uh, yeah. You can if you draw an element from that, then you can resist a moment around that. Yes. So like the reason it's it's vertical is any any direction like this, the moments around that will be resisted by these horizontal forces. Yes? That's, yes. Yeah, sorry, that's what I was trying to say. It, it, always there's a, there's a line between the two points where this analysis would say you can move. Right? Yeah, so um, I agree with the sentiment. I just want to think a second before I call it a theorem. Um, he says, is, is, is it true that you can't get with two fingers? Um, every, all of these statements are known. They're very well, like it, the same way we asked you how many points do you need for ICP, there's very like a complete analysis of how many fingers you need to achieve force closure in whatever dimensions. It sure sounds like to me that this should, you should not be able to do it with two points in this. But I would I would check it before I call it a theorem. Yeah. Okay, let me continue. Yes. So um, this notion that I hope is is clear that a pretty good heuristic that comes out of the model based grasp analysis is that we want to do look for collinear antipodal points. And the next leap I want to make with you is that even if I just have a mess of objects in front of me. And I don't even know what's an object, what's two objects. I just got a pile of stuff. If I want to pick stuff up pretty well, a pretty darn good heuristic is to look for places where I can stick my hand, okay, where I can get my fingers pointing on normals on the point cloud. Okay, I'll take a point cloud of my object, and I'll look for normals in my point cloud, and I'll try to find places that fit nicely in my hand, that have collinear antipodal grasps as much as possible, okay? And that turns out to be a shockingly good heuristic for picking everything up, okay? You just go look for places that you get your nice flats in there, you're not in collision, and you can pick up everything, yeah.
Absolutely, yes. So, 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 um, you, so, so the, the way that plays out, let me just make sure this, it's clear. So um, the, uh, the wrench that you could resist would be the same. The total wrench you could resist would be the same in both of those cases, no matter where your fingers are. It just depends on the geometry of your cones. But you, there is already a wrench from gravity, right? And if that wrench from gravity is, is you know, large and putting a big torque because you're not near the center of mass, then that eats away at the, what you have left to resist uh, external wrenches, right? So the closer you are to the center of mass, the more you're, uh, you're already canceling. You know, you've, you've got the gravity wrench in the middle of your, um, in your, of your contact wrench set. Yeah? Awesome. OK, so the next step then is um, look at a pile of stuff and figure out where the antipodal grasps are, OK? Um, and I should say, there's been a, a, a lot of, there's kind of a, there was a movement of people, um, it, it was a big deal, right? I think for a long, long time, every manipulation system would look at the table, start by trying to have a CAD model of the geometry you're going to pick up, doing pose estimation of that geometry, making, you know, finding an opt a grasp, opt you know, this was how everything worked before. And it was, it corresponded with deep learning starting to work and people getting more aggressive. But people started just picking up everything, like just throwing out that assumption. And there was a series of papers that I think really changed the way we thought about that. Um, you know, grasp pose detection in point clouds, pick and place of novel objects, DexNet. There's a whole, there's, we're up to DexNet like 15 now. Um, that's not true. I'm sorry, Ken, I was just teasing. Um, yeah, but they've had a series of papers on DexNet getting better and better and handling more and more cases. Um, and this is maybe one of the first ones. They were, all, they were all pretty contemporary. They all happened around the same time. Okay. But the first time I saw this, I was like, wow, that's just different. We hadn't seen people dump random stuff and then start asking, you know, where do I pick up these random things? Okay. And the way they do this is with the same sort of grasp analysis, almost, okay. But they start looking at the point cloud, okay. They, in all three of those actually were using deep learning, okay, but they were typically trained in simulation with um, perfect point clouds trying to find antipodal grasps. This one in particular was using antipodal grasps in simulation, and the reason they did deep learning was to uh, overcome partial views and occlusions in the real system, okay? But the heuristic was basically the same. And this did really, it shook things up. It was like, oh my gosh, we don't actually need models for everything. Okay. Yeah, I think you just squeeze until it stops going in. <laughs> Pretty much, that's what I do. It's uh, um, that's one of the reasons I like the shunk is that it's got a force limit. So you actually just tell it to go to closed, and you put a force limit. Just right. Don't put your fingers in there. Yeah. Um, no, so th this is a pretty common pipeline. It just it works surprisingly well. It has it has imperfections, and we'll talk about some of them. Okay, but yeah, you could just clear piles of stuff. This one was actually geometry only because at the time when everybody started uh, applying this, you know, and and saying deep learning makes this possible, we were kind of like, well, you could probably do that just with a geometry heuristic, and so we went through and. Lucas went through and just sort of did a geometry only version of it just to confirm that it's actually pretty good. There are limitations that will, you know, like the um, partial views and the like. Okay, so to do that, what we need to do is take a point cloud of the world and start estimating normals, okay? That's a hairy mustard bottle, <laughs> but that's the visualization of all the surface normals that are estimated directly from the point cloud. Okay, and that's just a little bit of geometry, and I'll step through some of it, okay, but, um, but you can do this on raw point clouds at frame rate, right? This is just totally simple, even though what we'll see is that every one of those normals is the result of a small optimization that solved, well, an SVD that solved, you know, by taking K nearest neighbors, okay, looking for uh, plane, so you already did your, your plane fitting, on the P set, right? You're basically going to do plane fitting on K nearest neighbors around every one of those points. 
And when I first started getting into like the point cloud world, I was like, yeah, okay, but you're not going to do it at every point, at every frame, right? And I was just wrong. People do it at every point, on every frame. They're going to do nearest neighbors. They got efficient data structures. They got, and computers are faster now than they were when I start, when I first had that reaction. But yeah, this stuff's just fast and good. Okay. So let's just think about how that works. Um, if you if you've got a noisy point cloud coming in. And there's kind of a series of, of uh, there's a collection of tools that people do on point clouds, like a collection of algorithms. There used to be a great library. It still exists, but it's not maintained and probably runs on Ubuntu 14 or something. But there's a thing called the point cloud library, PCL. Everybody loved it. We used, everybody used it. The documentation, people still refer to the documentation. The documentation is like, um, nobody wrote a book on point cloud processing ever, but this guy wrote a point cloud library, and his documentation is like the book that people use on point cloud processing, roughly. Um, so there's a grab bag of tools, PCL, that's what I was just talking about. Nowadays, there's a, a kind of a replacement for it is Open3D. Um, these are the software packages that people use. I've implemented all the ones that we use regularly in Drake just as a... Um, there's a lot of fancier things that people could do, but the, the baseline ones are very simple and I just went implemented them. <clears throat> so if you take our manipulation station, our hardware station that has a couple bins and a camera's put around the bins, say we've got our three cameras around each bin, that's the setup I've been using here, right? That means we're going to get six, sorry, yeah, six RGBD images. And you have to go from those RGBD images into some something that looks like a hairy mustard bottle, right? So how are we going to do it? The first thing is you you got to subtract out the known objects in the world. Okay, so you end up cropping your point cloud. The order of these matters, by the way, and these are just sort of operations on point clouds that you can do. So the first one we almost always do is we crop away, um, you know, to remove known objects like the bins. And for instance, we're just going to restrict our attention to the area inside the, the bin. OK, the second step, again, this, the order matters. So I'll put a one, two, is normal estimation. which I hinted at, which, you know, is, is K nearest neighbor, find the, do plane fitting. I'll, if I have time, I'll go through some of that, okay? But it's interesting, you actually do normal estimation on each of the independent cameras. And then after you do the normal estimation, you merge the point clouds into one big point cloud. And the reason you want to do that first is that the, the normal estimation, you know, which is going to be looking for, for planes, right, and estimating the normal to be the, the direction that fits the, you know, the normal of that plane, that's only going to be good up to a reflection, right? You don't know actually if the normal is pointing out or pointing in. So in order to know which direction the normal is, you want to know where the camera was, okay? So before you throw away the camera information, you go ahead and estimate the normals and make sure you flip the normals towards the camera. Okay. Once you've got the normals that are nice and happy, you take your point cloud, annotate it with the normals, and fuse it into one big point cloud. And so you'll have you know, different things that are estimated, possibly points that are very much on top, hopefully points that are very much on top of each other with hopefully similar normals, right? And you're going to summarize them as one big point cloud. But you don't want to work with that inefficient object. It's also probably sampled you know, non-uniformly and maybe way more densely than you want. Okay. So the last step is then you go and downsample everything. Okay.
And the downsampling, um, you typically do that by putting the entire point cloud object into a voxel grid. And then you just summarize at for one per voxel, basically. You, you, so you make a uniform, in, everything in 3D, you can just like <laughs> make bins in 3D. Three dimensions is low, is small, and you can, you can make a nice grid in 3D. If there's a point inside there, so the simplest idea would be if there's a point inside there, I'll say there's a point, right? In, pr in practice, you actually average the points and find, you summarize all the points that landed in this voxel with one point that is the average of those. And similarly, the normals, all the points that it landed in that same voxel, I'll take the average normal of those, for instance. Okay, and that's when you get this nice, I can turn off the, you know, that's how you get this nice downsampled, clean, in fact, I've got all the steps there here. Right, so I had my point cloud zero, my point cloud one, point cloud two, right, those are all separate, but they're higher dimensional than I, I care about. I crop them. Oh, sorry, if I if I zoomed out, I think point cloud zero would actually have the bin in it too. And it has the other camera in it, for instance. Okay. Once I crop them, I get rid of that. Going from point cloud one to point cloud one cropped, I get rid of the camera. Okay, and then yeah, I merge them into this one. I downsample them. I get this nicer one. And then I can estimate the normals of the. Uh, I can plot the normals. I estimated the normals before I did that. Okay, I even had a, got a cool little notebook, of course. Okay, so right on the raw point cloud where I know where it's going, I really do zoom in. I pick any point in that point cloud. I take its k nearest neighbors, right? And then I fit a plane to it with SVD, okay? And then I can draw, I can, you know, for all of them. So this, you see my nearest neighbors are in blue, okay? Now the SVD, of course, it's, you can see it's jumping around in the, the, it's sort of an arbitrary choice. It's not actually arbitrary. So I'll tell you what it is in a second here. But the, the second dimensions are a little less consistent. But you got that little operation that happens on all of the points on the point cloud. It turns out, so the, um, the direction that has the least amount of variability of the points, that's the normal. Right? That's the, you want to find the flat, right? And if, in practice, it's a little bit curved. The normal is the direction that has the least curvature, like, or the, yeah, the least curvature like that. The direction of most curvature is also available. It's, it turns out these are all the eigenvalues that come out of the data matrix. The, the one corresponding to the, what is it, the lowest eigenvalue is the steepest curvature. The highest eigenvalue is the flattest one. So when you do your normal estimation, you also get the directions of curvature on the surface, a local estimate of the curvature on the surface, which can be useful for grasp analysis, right? So if you want to find things, find places that have low curvature or high curvature, that's also pretty useful. Right? And then you do the voxelation by just dropping it into a big box and then get the, the lower dimensional object, one per, one per voxel. So let me just, um, I said that a little bit quickly. Let me just say it with equations. The normal estimation really is, is clean and clever. So what you'd like to do, you've got a bunch of points in the nearest neighbor, that's the blue, right? And you know your, your current point is somewhere in the middle of that cloud because they're defined by their nearest neighborness, okay? And the objective to, to optimize in the normal estimation is you'd like to minimize over the normal vector n, okay? The sum over your k nearest neighbors of, it looks like an ugly objective, but let's 
give it a chance. Okay, so this is the nominal point that I'm looking around, the position of the nominal point. This is the ith neighbor. And this is the normal vector, right? So you'd like the dot product of the normal with this thing to be small. That, that object, right, the pi, if this is the ith point, then the, that's a vector like this. Every, for every i, I have a vector like this going here. You want to find the n that makes the dot products with that small. Okay, that looks like a really gross objective, you know, the way I've written it. Maybe not, because p, p is, this is all data. Right, so it just looks like a quadratic problem in n. Yeah. So remember, I'm gonna take, every, I'm gonna take a point on the mustard bottle. That's P, that's the point I picked, yeah? And then I'm gonna take its neighbors, yeah? Okay, so it turns out just by reshaping that a little bit, then you can write that whole thing as the sum over I N transpose, you just put that whole thing in the middle. N, which is just N transpose W N, where W is the data matrix again, just like what we saw a little bit in ICP. And it's for the same reason, roughly, but. Okay, and you want to minimize this subject you just because um, you have to put a bound on N for that to be well defined. I want to find the unit normal that makes that small. So when I see a quadratic objective with a unit normal constraint only, that's exactly where the SVD comes in. Again, because you take your, yeah, you basically just take the SVD and set the diagonal matrix to ones and that gives you the, the solution to these problems. Okay, and the eigenvalues of W tell you the directions, the, the directions of curvature. So the eigenvector is, uh, are the three eigenvectors are the normal, the direction of most curvature, and then the other direction. It's very, very clean, very good. And you would, still, you would still think that's kind of expensive, especially if k is large. I mean, you have to find the neighbors, okay? But again, it just happens for every point all the time. Yeah, the solution is, um, you basically just take the SVD of this W matrix and it, it will pop out the, the bases. You set the diagonal equal to, to one and that tells you exactly what the normals have to be. Oh, it's, in, it's all written up carefully, yeah. Yes? Yes? You're setting all of that to one. Sorry. The norm was. Yeah, so we have, we have these you're saying what you're asking about this part? Okay. Yeah. Oh, sigma is your diagonal entry in the in the SVD. Okay, good. Yes, sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, but so so good. So um, the the whole diagonal entry tells you tells you about the three directions. Yes. So we so um, it's true that the one that has that corresponds to the largest, the smallest, smallest. Yeah, is that right? The largest curvature, yeah, no, you're right, smallest. Good, smallest. That's just to get the, the norm uh, one here. For, the, we, we figure out which one is, is the normal, 
by looking at the magnet at the magnitudes of the it, it happens this is square so it's also you could just do eigenvalue analysis too. Okay. Now your intuition is exactly, exactly right. I didn't I just I think I confused you when I said you're going to set the diagonal to 1. That's only to just pick out a normal vector of of unit norm. But the directions are strictly by looking at the magnitude of the diagonals. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, the SV, the, the the normal estimation as I've written it, could has a fifty percent chance of picking. You know, it's sort of the numerics will have it pick a, a normal in either direction. You don't know which one it is. So, um, so then we use the camera when we flip the normals to be towards the camera. The normal is because we think antipodal grasps are a good thing to pick. We're looking for for places where the normals are equal and opposite. Yeah. Yes. No, form closure is a stronger thing, and uh, it would re it would require you to have you know, kind of caged the object. It doesn't even guarantee force closure. It's a heuristic that's that from our grasp analysis we saw that we would re be able to resist larger wrenches if our if our fingers are antipodal. Yeah. But it's an additional, to say that we can resist all wrenches is an additional thing. Yeah? Okay. So now we basically got it. So I uh, have to stop it. Okay. So here's my, um, here's my algorithm. Okay, I'm going to take my point cloud. And I'm going to start sampling possible grasps. And I'll score the possible grasp by based on a few heuristics. Most importantly, I want to see if I've got antipodal grasps inside there. Now, because I'm going to do that with, uh, on data, what I'll actually do is I'll just compute the normal for all the points. And I'll kind of sum the normals that are inside my fingers. Okay, Details, it, these are all very heuristic. So I, I don't think they deserve to appear on the blackboard. But, but as a you know, as an approximation, the first thing you do is you you take your possible grasp, you put it around your point cloud, you actually crop away all the points that are not inside your fingers, and then you start analyzing the points in your. Well, first you could say if I'm in collision, that's a bad grasp candidate. Just throw that one out. If I'm upside down, that's a bad grasp candidate. Throw that out. But once I've got something that's not in collision, I'll examine all the points that are just inside my fingers. Okay, and if the normals of those look like they're pointing in the x-axis, okay? I assume I'm not penetrating the object, but if they're, if they're pointing in the x-axis, then I've got a pretty good antipodal grasp candidate, okay? The more of those I have, the happier I am. I've probably got a big, fat part of the object space, and that's it. So we can start sampling with a, we have a simple score function that evaluates, you know, based on the point cloud. Okay, so I can now, oh shoot, I broke my visualization. Imagine there's a mustard bottle there. Okay. Oh, I totally broke my visualization. Hopefully the next one works. I have to check this one. All right, there we go. So I, I dropped some random objects out of the sky. I used these cameras to do the point cloud processing. I came up with a downsampled um, thing. I didn't draw the normals because it just makes everything look hairy and doesn't really matter here. But I used those normals in the computation. And then I started picking grasps. Now, I didn't pick grasps completely at random. That would be pretty inefficient. So what I did is I took points that are on the point cloud and put one of my one of my fingers right near that point and normal to that point, okay? And then I, um, I did the computation I just talked about, which was kind of looking at the points inside. And as a last step, I sort of centered it just so I wasn't like this, okay? So it's a pretty good sampling heuristic for sort of generating possible candidates. And it, if, every time I run it, it'll come up with little, um, you know, that's not a very 
interesting scene, I guess, but let me, if I drop it again. Okay, yeah, so I've got some different objects, and my hand reaches down and proposes a bunch of different possible grasp candidates. Okay, and then I score each of them with my little heuristic that doesn't get on the board, you know, but, but it's, it's fine. Like, it works really well. Like, it works in, on the real robots. And this is the first thing that I would say you can take this to the robot with, with, with no real, there's really no gap between you implementing, you know, the, the, ba the basic ideas here and it working. And, the, and I've showed, I've got the end-to-end -end demo I already showed you um, that, that just runs the entire notebook. The last piece we need to put it all together is to program the high-level logic of if you can miss the, the grasp, go back and try again and stuff like this. But in terms of like going and picking one grasp and moving it over, you have all the pieces. And this would work on a real system, right? The real system's gonna have noisier point clouds, okay? But this is a very robust estimator. It can work in a least square sense against noisy point clouds, okay? And then, yeah, just uh, picking a handful of samples and keeping the best will go down and pick things up all day long. Yeah? Yes. Yep. Well, so, um, okay, it's surround, like if the arm was going to be in collision, then I haven't considered that. So, but, but the, gr the gripper being in collision, I actually do collision check the point cloud with the gripper. So it wouldn't try to get itself in that. But you're right, if the arm was in collision, I put, a pr I put another preference in my cost function to, for coming down from above so that it's not trying to grab from the side very much. But those work pretty well. Let me, let me make my last point and then we'll I'll take some more questions. Okay, so I do think that there are limitations to this. And Lucas actually kind of made a, made a couple of videos that showed this. Uh, did you see what happened there? That arm was completely occluding, but there's two objects, right? That were exactly back to back, right? Let me show it again. See those two objects? That sort of defeats my heuristic. There was two objects. They just happened to be thin. They happened to have antipodal grasps. They were pointing like this. This algorithm has no idea what an object is. Okay, so it picked that up as if it was one object, which maybe is if you're just if your goal is to clear the bin, no big deal. If your goal is to singulate objects, that's a fail. Right? There's a couple other things. So that's the double pick idea. It just there's no understanding of what an object here is anywhere. Okay, another one is, uh, you might find it, it doesn't know anything about center of mass, for instance, right? So um, it could pick up like a hammer from like the very corner, right? And it would come up and then the moment, the, from, you know, would take it out and fall. There's, there's just no notion of what the, uh, of what the object is. Um, if you do have partial views, then you don't have any way to find an antipodal grasp. If you only have one camera looking from the side, so people started doing things like shape completion, trying to, uh, try to estimate what was behind the, the, on the other side that I can't see. But what worked better, faster, was taking simulation where you could see things from all angles and training a neural network to basically say, this is a good grasp given what I can see, and then using that on the fly. And that's one of the ways that, that, that learning really helped overcome the limitations of the real sensor. Um, and then, you know, of course, just by, because it depends on, on depth cameras, it doesn't work, for instance, for transparent objects very well. Okay, but, you know, that's a relatively short list for a pretty simple algorithm that goes pretty far. Yeah? What was your question? Um, this was just of the grasp. I said, if it's in collision, I'll just reject it. It's interesting to ask, why did I do sampling instead of optimization? But I have kind of this natively sampled object. And so it actually, and it's at a hard optimization. So we, we tend to just sample a bunch of candidates, throw away the ones that don't, that violate a constraint, and then, opt, then pick the one that just had the best objective. Yeah. Yep, yeah, it does all that. It naturally picks the things on top. Okay, thanks very much. Yep. Yeah.